permitting. Almost everybody needs more education after high school. What they don't need is to chase after this fraudulent, destructive, antediluvian thing called a BA. Uh, the, the thesis of my argument really is that the BA is the work of the devil. Um, <laughs> let's go through each of those accusations. Uh, first, fraudulent. The BA is supposed to signify, in a very old-fashioned term, that you are an educated man, now an educated person. You know and I know that it doesn't represent that anymore. The number of colleges that require the core courses that go into a liberal education is virtually, it's virtually not, uh, don't exist, uh, but it's what much worse than that. If the only thing you know about a person is that that person has a BA, you don't know anything. If that seems too extreme, um, I can document all kinds of stories about courses in introductory economics, which use magazine articles as the text, uh, about students who get a BA after four years without having to write a single solitary term paper, about uh, exam scores, which by any traditional grading system means a D or an F, but guess what? They're transmuted into Bs. And why are they transmuted into Bs? Because the story they have now is retention whereby the, the point of a college is to bring in as much tuition money as you can, and you've got to retain kids, and in fact, if they want to drop out of courses and stay for five or six years instead of four, that's just fine with the college. You can talk to employers all over the country who will tell you about applicants who have BAs, who can't write grammatical sentences uh, in their applications, and sometimes can't read very well. All of these things do not refer to the products of a few diploma mills. I am talking about large chunks of the second tier and third tier state college and university systems, and I'm also talking about large numbers of courses and students in the first tier system and a whole lot of very expensive elite colleges. Knowing what major a person had doesn't tell you very much. Uh, yeah, if it's math, if it's hard sciences, if it's engineering, okay. But what does it mean if you have a political science degree, spoken as a person who has a political science degree, if you're going to an employer and saying, you ought to hire me? It doesn't really mean anything. Now, here's what you do know about a person with a BA, if you know what school they came from. So if the applicant came from Harvard, you know a whole lot about what that person was like at age 18, before he went to college. You know he had terrific SAT scores, then you know he had a terrific high school record or he wouldn't have gotten in. You don't know anything about what Harvard has added. And as a graduate of that institution, trust me, I am living uh, proof of, of that statement in a whole bunch of ways. None of this should be news to any of you. The retreat of the academy from rigorous education is known to everybody who's in higher education. Except for majors in engineering, math, and the hard sciences, which account for just 12% of undergraduates, the bachelor's degree all by itself is meaningless. Okay, destructive. Uh, even though we know that the BA is substantively meaningless, it remains true that for millions of jobs, you can't get a job interview unless you have one. And the problem is that employers are behaving rationally when they do that, because you've got about 32% of adults that have a BA. The employers know how clueless many of them are. Why should they go outside that pool uh, and, and, and take even lower levels of the population in terms of their ability. So they're, they're, they're being rational, but the problem is this. Uh, we have created a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. We have created a culture in which not having a BA labels you in the minds of way too many people as being either dumb or lazy. And so a lot of ambitious kids who have no interest in sitting in classrooms for four years and accumulate, uh, accumulating these large student loan debts, nonetheless want the piece of paper. It is not surprising that we have all the horror stories, which are documented in journal articles and large surveys, not anecdotally, of kids who take the easiest possible classes and don't study. They aren't there to get an education, they're there to get a piece of paper. It is hugely destructive to have created this kind of false credential. It is destructive to the majority of young people who don't try to go to college because they know college is not for them. It is destructive for about 40% of those who start college who never finish. But most of all, it is destructive to America's civic culture. 
we have always prided ourselves upon the idea that everybody is equal in all the ways that count with regard to human dignity. We have given a meaningless educational credential a role in our culture that says otherwise. Antediluvian. I have time just to state the proposition and hope to have a chance to elaborate later. The four-year brick and mortar college is obsolete. Four years is almost always too long. There's hardly any profession that requires four years of classwork. A lot of them require an apprenticeship much longer than that. The rationale for a big physical plant and a residential college is, is just vanishing. What's the rationale for having a library these days? It used to be central. Why should it be that the brilliant professor giving a lecture where he doesn't take any individual uh, relationships with students, but just giving a superb lecture, why is he giving that lecture to 150 kids who happen to be sitting in the hall? Why isn't it being given to millions? Distance education has all sorts of possibilities it didn't have before. The information revolution is giving us a cornucopia of new ways to help kids get an education. Well, that just begins to say what I want to say, but what I'm really coming down to is nobody should go to college as the system is now defined. What we need is a transformation that gives young people a chance to tell employers, or for that matter to tell graduate admissions officers, what they know and what they can do, not where they learned it and how long it took them. Thank you. Well, let me actually just uh, start with that, uh, that question. I, you know, I went to Stanford undergrad, Stanford Law School. Uh, throughout the 90s, I had a belief that education was absolutely paramount. We should only hire people who went to the best schools, um, and, uh, and we discriminated on this basis very aggressively in hiring at PayPal, and I used this, I used to, and I, I, I thought this was the, the most important thing um, in our society. And over the last four or five years, I've gradually come to uh, shift my views on it. Uh, for a number of different reasons. Uh, uh, the narrow technology context in Silicon Valley is that I saw so many very talented people who had not gone through college tracks and who had still done uh, extraordinarily well. In some ways, they were often more creative. They were not uh, laden down with these enormous college uh, debts that uh, were somehow uh, forcing people to take uh, better paying jobs that were um, more remunerative but more boring and track them into things that were not as, uh, not as uh, interesting or important uh, that were discouraging people from doing things in nonprofits, uh, nonprofit work or uh, on the more entrepreneurial side. And this has become a more and more acute issue over the years because unlike the time when I went to college, the cost has gone up tremendously. The amount of debts people leave college with, with have gone up tremendously. And so the choices are very different from the ones people had 25 years ago. A high school, uh, the college uh, costs in um, nominal dollars have gone up by more than a factor of 10 since 1980. Um, even after inflation, it's gone up by 300%, costs about four times as much. Inflation adjusted to go to college now as it did 30 years ago. It's gone up more than anything else in our society, more than health care, more than housing, more than any of a number of other things we think of as uh, having been subject to runaway cost inflation and escalation. Um, and, uh, and as I've looked outside of just the narrow Silicon Valley entrepreneurial context, I've come to believe that the problem is much broader, that it's not just the most talented people who are perhaps being misdirected and encouraged to go on a very narrow tracked career, but that this is a broader problem and that we are in fact experiencing something of a bubble in education, a bubble that is as pernicious as the bubbles we had in uh, technology in the 90s and housing in the 2000s. And like those two other bubbles, it is characterized by two things. Number one, runaway costs, where people are paying more and more for something where the quality hasn't gone up. In the, in the 90s, it was tech stocks. In the 2000s, it was housing. Education, I'm not saying it's worse than it was 30 years ago, but I don't think it's gotten much better. And secondly, by an incredible psychosocial dynamic where you cannot question it. And in 99, in Silicon Valley, you couldn't question the NASDAQ valuations, and in 2005, um, you could not question people buying houses. It was strictly taboo and forbidden. Uh, and in the same way, uh, this is the one thing people still really believe in our society. And to question um, the value of education is like questioning uh, the existence of Santa Claus with uh, three-year-old uh, kids or something like that. Um, and while uh, we're not trying to scare the children here or anything like that, 
we do think that uh, we cannot afford to have a third bubble in this country. We had two already. They were catastrophically bad. They led to enormous misallocation of resources. And when we look at education more carefully, there are a lot of worrisome signs. Uh, student debts at this point total over a trillion dollars. Uh, and when you look at how well people are doing who come out of college, uh, they are still doing pretty well. They're still doing better than they used to. But the outperformance has been going down. It's been going down since about 2000. Um, uh, and uh, you know the law school context I'm quite familiar with. There are about 50,000 people a year who graduate from law school in the US. There only are 30,000 legal jobs available in the US. And I would argue we have maybe too many lawyers as is. But uh, we're producing way more for a society that probably already has too many. The median wage for lawyers is 62,000, which isn't that great considering that you've taken on another quarter million in law school debt typically. Uh, Pre-med, uh, there are only about 9% of the people who study pre-med have slots available to them in medical school. The other 91% are wasting their time. And somebody should have told them that their freshman or sophomore year and not waited till their senior year or several years of uh, post-college to figure that sort of stuff out. If you, you know, broaden the ambit uh, more, more generally, there's something like 17 million people in the labor force who have college degrees and are basically doing unskilled work. Um, or uh, sort, of the, sort of find narrow and extreme statistics. There's something like 6,100 people in the US who have uh, PhDs and are doing janitorial work. And so when we, uh, when we uh, say that uh, you know, education is important and paramount, uh, that is true, but it can also be a distortion and it can be a distraction from some of the very real problems we have as a society. We need to figure out how do we create more jobs? How do we create more good paying jobs? We don't have enough of either in our society. And uh, while education is linked to them, it's not this absolute thing. And, uh, and what we want to question is this notion that education is an absolute good or an absolute necessity. And in fact, when people say, as our opponents do, that it is an absolute good or an absolute necessity, you start ignoring all these problematic facts. You start uh, making a lot of catastrophic approximations that abound. Um, and, uh, and that's what we want to sort of push back a little bit. Let me say one thing that we're not arguing for. We're not saying that nobody should go to college. We're not saying that college is categorically a bad thing. We're not saying everybody should drop out. We're simply saying that too many people are going to college, just like too many people are buying housing and too many tech companies were going public in the late 90s. Uh, doesn't mean there should be no tech companies or no houses. Um, it doesn't mean we should shut down all the colleges, but we, shouldn't, we need to make this a much more careful, deliberate choice. And what we are hoping to start with this discussion and debate today is a discussion that would encourage all of you to think more about your future. Do not think of education as something uh, that's an automatic ticket to the future. You need to think about it yourself. If I had to do something over again, having gone to Stanford, I probably would still go to college, even with the higher costs. Um, I, I didn't have any great ideas of what to do instead. Uh, I'd probably still do the exact same thing as I did in the late 80s, even with all the problems. But one thing I would try to do very differently is not accept the answer that this was the automatic thing, that this was the thing you should do without thinking. I would have tried to think about what I want to do with my life as a senior in high school and a senior in college, and not simply have more education be the automatic default answer for everything. The question we want to push the other side back on a little bit is, if education is an absolute good or absolute necessity, who is accountable if there's a mistake? And if these people are taking on these enormous debts and are getting it wrong, um, where can they go to get a refund? Peter Thiel, your time is up. Thank you Thank very you. much.